I want to bring awareness to everyone around me who sees this story. And I don't want another family member to go through what I have gone through, another mother to go through what I have gone through, or another family, because it is very devastating. And fentanyl is an epidemic that we're going through right now that is taking anyone and everyone who gives it an opportunity. Jake passed away April 24th of 2020. It was right at the start of COVID and um, he was out partying with a friend or a so-called friend and they left him there. They were partying, we're not sure if he, he had taken a Percocet or if it was through cocaine. I do know that the autopsy, what the detective had told me was um, there was fentanyl in there. And even before the autopsy um, was done, the detective did tell me that it was most likely that my son passed away from fentanyl. And at the time, I did not know what fentanyl was. I had heard of it, but here in El Paso, fentanyl wasn't a big thing. Nobody knew about fentanyl. And I mean, I didn't even, I didn't understand to where a point where I told the detective, if fentanyl was in a drug that my son had taken, he would know because my son was a smart kid, and I'm sure that if he knew that that drug was going to kill him, he wouldn't have taken it. Jake, growing up, he was a character. He was always joking around, even making funny faces, laughing. As he grew up in his school age years, he loved to read, loved to read chapter books. He played football. He played basketball. He even played hockey. Jake was always really funny. Uh, he was, he would always bring me food when I asked him to. Uh, he was, he was, I guess like a, just, he played like the big brother role, like in all the right ways. Uh, the best word to describe him was he had this ambition in him. He wanted to be successful. He wanted to make it in life. Um, even in high school, played football, took advanced level courses. The child would never study, and he would manage to get great grades. Once he graduated, him and his girlfriend at the time, she's been the only girlfriend that I ever met, they moved to Wiley, Texas with her aunt. And getting to Wiley, that fall semester, he enrolled into Collin College started taking some business courses. And he, I one time got a phone call, received a phone call from him, and he told me, Mom, I'm gonna prove to you that I can be successful without a college degree. Me being a counselor, a high school counselor, I was like, this kid is challenging me and you need college and there was no other way. So I'm all like, okay, show me. So sure enough, he did. He opened up a flooring company in Wiley, Texas, which was Floor USA, and he became successful at it. Soon after that, him and his girlfriend that he had since he was in high school, they had Alina, his daughter, which is now eight, and then later they had Josie, which is now five, five years old. I know he wanted to, to be successful, and he wanted to buy a house for his family. But on the other end, Jacob had an issue. He had a drug issue. Since high school, he started smoking marijuana, and um, that was always a problem for me because me being a high school counselor, I'm supposed to guide these children to not to do drugs, to lead them on the right path. 
And him and his brother, they would smoke. And it brought a lot of conflict in my home. I believe that weed is a gateway drug to all this because Jake would smoke weed and I've had these conversations where marijuana doesn't do anything. I use it for anxiety. I mean, they've even told me, smoke a joint and your knee pain will go away or smoke a joint and your back pain will go away. Um, and that was my, my biggest fight with my boys is that I wanted them to, to grow up to be respectable men, to be hard workers, to, to do well, and not just money-wise, but to find happiness, to be a good husband, to be a good father. And um, there was times that I would call over there, I would call Dallas, and um, I would talk to my son Josh, and there was times that Josh would tell me, Mom, Jake is doing great, he's not smoking, he's not doing anything, he's focusing on his business, so it would make me happy. Because Jake, I would call him and he would always tell me, Mom, I'm, I'm busy working, I can't talk to you right now, I'll call you later. And the times that he would call me, or that I would have an opportunity to talk to him, um, was in the mornings where he would tell me, he would call me bright and early, and I would tell him, where are you going? And he goes, well, Mom, the early bird gets the worm, so I'm off to work. That always made me happy when he was doing something productive. And um, him and Brianna, they started having issues because my son was not an angel. I will never say my son was an angel. You know, he liked to go out and party with his so-called friends. And um, I'm sure that he was smoking weed. And then later I learned that he was doing Percocet pills and that he was doing cocaine. To this day, I still don't understand how, what was, what is the big hype of Percocet pills? Um, but he was taking Percocet pills, and Brianna called me and told me, Jenny, he's starting to do cocaine. And so when I would reach out to talk to him and tell him, you know, what are you doing? Don't you know that, that you're gonna destroy your family? And just like I used to have those conversations with his dad, like, you're going to lose, you have a lot to lose. And this is a cycle. This is going to go into your, your children if you don't stop. I always tried pushing him, which I, I didn't really have to push. I always took him to church, and, and he, he loved going to church. Whenever times were, whenever him and Brianna were having issues, he would always tell her, we got to go to church. And he would take him and her to church with their baby at the time, Alina. And um, there was times that he just tried getting back on the right track. And these so-called friends, and I can't blame the friends because my son had a choice. I know he had a choice. He had a choice to say, you know what, I'm going to stay home. I'm going to be with my children. I'm not going to go party. I'm not going to go to the club with you. But these people, like my son Josh would say, Mom, Jake knew so many people from his business. He knew rich people, poor people, shady people, good people, church people. He knew all kinds of people. And um, he chose to go with these people to party all the time. And that caused a lot of issues with the family, with his family. Brianna ended up leaving him. And when she left him, which I don't blame her, he started spiraling down. He was going out all the time. He was hanging out with the wrong crowd. Um, he started doing more cocaine because my older son would call me and tell me, Mom, you got to come to Dallas and you got to pick up Jake and take him home because he's doing cocaine now. Being a counselor, I know that I can't force anybody to recovery. I know I can't bring him home kicking and screaming, and I can't handcuff him to a bed. I can't lock him in a cellar. So all I could do was talk to him and just tell him, remind him about the consequences. One of the, 
the phrases I would always tell him, for every action, there's going to be a consequence, either it be a positive or a negative. And he would tell me, no, Mom, I got this. I'm good. I'm good. And at one time, when I had spoken to him in the morning, because I would, I would usually have my conversations with him in the morning as I was driving to work, he told me, he goes, Mom, I'm, I'm doing drugs because it hurts too much not to be with the girls, meaning Brianna, Alina, and Josie. And so I was always trying to tell him, well, you can do that. You can. You just have to get back on a good path. You have to focus. You have to clean yourself up, continue going to church, pray, and um, do the right thing and, and stop stop hanging out with all these people that are are influencing you to do drugs. Uh, he continued. He continued to use Apparently, it got worse. The drugs got worse. He was doing the Percocets. He was, um, and first it was cocaine, then the Percocets. And um, right before Jake passed away, he had, he was in jail for about a week because of his child support. He owed child support. And um, he was bailed out. And I kept on telling, it was during COVID. So his dad kept on telling my older son, Josh, to bail him out because God forbid he gets COVID. And my thing was leave him there, leave him there. And they bailed him out. He got out on a Monday. He called me on a Tuesday. And for some reason, we didn't argue that phone, that last phone call we had. All he told me was that Mom, I love you, and you need to be careful with COVID because I don't know what I'd do without you. Little did I know it was going to be the other way around, where I don't know how to be without him. So that happened on Tuesday. He was there with my son Josh at his apartment and his daughter Alina. They were playing video games and they went out to eat. And then after that, he went with his friends again. And they were at one hotel and then they moved on to the Hilton in Addison, Texas. And he was with a female and a male. And they checked in like I want to say early, 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 early in the morning on Thursday. And by that time, he had stopped. His phone had died. And um, he was not answering. So Friday morning, my son calls me, and he tells me, Mom, we can't find Jake. We are, we're looking for him, and he's not answering his phone. And knowing my son, he would always, he never carried a charger with him, so his phone would die. I'm like, it's okay, he's going to charge the phone, and you'll, you'll talk to him. Me and my mom had just came back from getting Starbucks. Uh, we had just came back home, and um, we, we came back in, and we were kind of just sitting there, and then we get a knock at the door, and it was the uh, police officers. El Paso PD. And they asked me to step outside. I was completely confused. And there was three of them. And they told me that they had, that Addison PD had found my son, Jacob, deceased in a hotel at the Addison, at the Addison Hilton. The next thing I know is when I come back is my mom sitting in the kitchen and the police officers are asking are asking if she needs anything, like an ambulance. And then my mom tells me to call my grandma and um, my stepdad and tell them to come over uh, right now. And I thought everything was okay because my mom didn't have a reaction. Uh, she she kind of just looked blank, so I, I didn't know how to feel. So I had, I called them. I called my grandma and I called my stepdad. And it wasn't until uh, they came and that my mom told me that my brother had passed away. And I remember that I didn't, I didn't think it was real. Cause like, I just, I couldn't, I, it didn't really make sense to me that 
just like that, like there was no warning. And that night, they gave me a phone number to call the detective. And um, the detective from over there would give me information. So that Friday, we left to Dallas. The next day, I called the, the detective, Detective Marshall. I wanted answers. I had so many questions, and I wanted answers. And all the detective would tell me was, ma'am, your son was acting a fool. This, this is why this happened. And more than likely, he passed away from fentanyl. And that's when I asked, well, what is fentanyl? And he kind of told me it's a drug that, that will kill you. It's a very lethal drug that is being put into other drugs. And I never knew that fentanyl, you cannot see it, smell it, or taste it. Now I know. Um, I told them... I told him that my son would never do that because my son loves science and math and he should know better than to do fentanyl. Granted, I knew nothing of, of the drug. And um, he goes, no, ma'am, your, your son was acting a fool. And this is why this happened. And so I'm all like, okay. Uh, I asked who was with him and the police department or the detective lied to me and told me that they were going to question his friend, who was her, his so-called friend that was with him. And um, he never did. He just had a phone conversation with him. And the female that was with him, they just talked to them over the phone. They didn't bring him into the, into the station. They didn't do anything, not until Two years later, when I got my head screwed on right again, I called the detective and I asked them, you know, you said you interrogated this kid, you know, what was the outcome and everything? And that's when he told me, oh, ma'am, I never told you that I, I questioned that I brought him into the office or anything like that. I talked to him over the phone. And back then, when I first spoke to the detective, the detective told me, oh, this guy, he's not going to talk. He goes, it's kind of like what they say about police officers, that we take care of our own. Well, criminals take care of their own, so he's not going to talk. And they left it as is. And um, they did pick up my son's phone. They went through the phone, but when we received the phone back, they had erased so many messages. And the reason why I know is because I sent those messages to my son when I was looking for him. And they said that they couldn't find anything, and they closed my case. So I have no closure. I have no leads. Uh, this past year, my case, I guess, went to the attorney general in Austin, and they closed it. I asked for a police report. They sent me a police report with a lot of um, black markers where they took out information, I guess, of the other people. And um, they told me that there was no evidence. And so there's nothing they could do for me. I know the people who he was with and who the people, and the guy that, the guy that he was with, he even told my son that Jake took Percocet pills that he took Percocet pills and that they took a Percocet pill, but they didn't die. I didn't know how fentanyl worked. Now I know the whole deal of how you make illicit fentanyl pills and you just throw it in, nothing has quality control. You do not have any control of how much goes to in each pill. It's just like a batch of cookies. So then later they told my son this guy that was with them said that Jake also did cocaine. But that guy told him, I did a hit of cocaine, and look, I'm still alive. So nobody bothered to send me the autopsy report. A year and a half later, again, when my head was starting to screw itself on, back on, I'm all like, I need the autopsy report. So I asked for it. They sent it to me, yet nobody 
interpreted it to me. Nobody called me. Nobody even told me it was ready. Um, I had a nurse interpret it for me. And it turns out, well, not only a nurse, but one of my doctors interpreted it for me. And my son had 9.10 NG nanograms, ML. And when they converted it, it's 0. 0.0009 of fentanyl. And he had 7.1 of cocaine in his system. So converting that, that was 0. 0.007 of cocaine. So that tells me that if somebody would have called 911 or somebody would have had Narcan and Narcandum, there's a possibility that my son would have still been here today, that he would still be here. But the way how he was found was he was in a sofa in the hotel. And as let, let, me, let me quote, unquote, as a detective said, he was peacefully sleeping there and was found dead. With There was no um, foul play. Nobody had hit him or nothing like as if Jake just lay down and he was placed gracefully on that sofa and that he didn't suffer anything. That's what the police officer told me, or the detective told me. From what I know now, as I was, they were helping me translate the autopsy report, my son went into a mild cardiac arrest. And yes, I know that when somebody overdoses, to fentanyl, and they, they go to sleep, and it starts lowering their breathing. I know that now. I didn't know that then. However, some, some people do go into a mild cardiac arrest, and some people don't. Some people just start snoring, and they that's actually one of the signs um, when they're overdosing in their sleep. And then I asked the the medical examiners, well, what time did my son pass away? And even then, nobody could give me a time. They could just give me an estimated time. They said that he possibly passed away maybe at 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, and he was found at 12, 22 the ne on Friday in the afternoon. And what is really ironic, and it still baffles me to this day, is that on Wednesday, when Jake was with these other people partying at the first hotel, they were also getting haircuts. And in that photo, there was liquor. And my son was smoking a blunt. It had to have been marijuana. And when that autopsy report came out, there's no marijuana. The autopsy report's negative to marijuana and to alcohol. So it makes me kind of wonder, did they do the blood work on the right person? Because I know my son was smoking marijuana. And I'm sure if he was doing cocaine, I'm sure he was drinking some type of alcohol. So I'm still very confused about all that. Case was closed, and it has been very challenging because I think if Every grieving mom wants the truth. Every grieving mom wants closure. Jeez, we even want to know what was their last meal they ate. We want to know what was their last thought they had. And with this, it's, you know, the detective had even told me, you know, this was at the, at the Hilton. I asked, was there any cameras of people who were going in and out of that room? And the detective said, oh, no, the cameras were off. Whenever I come into a hotel, I look at the room numbers. His room was 115. So that means he was on the first floor next to the office. So nobody saw anything. Nobody, did they question the staff? Did they ask any questions? Did, did they ask for, for footage? But nothing. I have my moments. I think grief comes in waves. The first year was the hardest. I would have a lot of breakdowns. My head was not screwed on right. I would forget every other thing people would tell me. 
I would make a lot of mistakes at work. Um, I struggled every single day. Even to this day, I struggle every single day. But one thing that has helped me has been Carlos Briano from the DEA. I um, accidentally met him, and because of him, he told me that I had to change my pain into something positive. And I was invited by Ann Milgram to go to the National Family Summit in Washington, D.C. last June. So when I went over there, I still didn't know what I was doing there, because like I tell you, everything just flies over your head because you're not there sometimes. <laughs> and when I was sitting in that conference and listening to all families that were speaking of their losses, of their child, their brother, their sister, Carlos Briano kept on looking at me and would tell me, Jennifer, are you getting that? El Paso doesn't have that. And, I'm all, and I finally sat there and it finally hit me, <laughs> like, oh, this is what you want me to do. You want me to bring awareness to El Paso. You want me to bring support for grieving families in El Paso. However, El Paso does struggle with stigma. A lot of people don't want to, they don't want to talk, tell their story. They're afraid of being judged. They're afraid of, God forbid, what their family would say if they found out their child died of a drug overdose. And I think doing advocacy, partnering up with the DEA, partnering up with JPD, doing what I do as my career as a counselor, I think all that has helped me. Has it healed me? No, we will never be healed. Grieving families or grieving parents can't stand it when people say, oh my gosh, you're so strong. We're not strong. We don't have a choice. We're survivors. You know, we didn't want a title to be strong. But we have to get up every single day and we have to make it work because we have other kids that are depending on us and other family members who are depending on us. There's always a lesson. I, funny, I would always tell my students, for every situation, for every negative situation, there's always a lesson or there's something positive that is gonna come out of this. The lesson is, and this was my big lesson, is that never in my wildest dreams or nightmares would I ever think that I would have a child that would pass from an overdose. Because back in my time, when I was young, when I was a teenager, nobody overdosed unless you were, you had a syringe in your wrists, in your veins, and you, you overdid it. That was the only way people overdosed. My kids aren't gonna overdose, they'll get over this phase. And yes, I was that mom that would say, not my child. And I think that's a big takeaway is that a lot of parents think, oh, not my child. This could never happen to my child because my child doesn't use drugs. My child is an A honor roll student. My son was an A honor roll student. My child's an athlete. My son was an athlete. My child is smart. My son was smart. And I think parents, from today, they think that just because their kid doesn't use drugs or isn't considered a quote unquote junkie or a bad kid, they think that they're in the safe zone. But fentanyl does not discriminate. A person who does, has never used drugs and somebody offers them a pill for anxiety or to sleep and they don't know where that pill is from and that person or that child takes that pill, they could pass from that. It could have fentanyl in it. Kids who are upcoming teenagers who want to experiment, all it takes is one time. It just takes one time for them to take a pill with their friends because they're like, hey, let's relax, let's, let's chill. You know, take the Xanax pill. It can happen to anybody. 
So it's not just the bad kids who are overdosing or not over, let me rephrase overdosing, who are being poisoned. It could happen to anybody. And it doesn't matter if you're rich, if you're poor, if you're black, if you're white, it doesn't matter. Fentanyl doesn't discriminate. The takeaway is never say, not my child. And another takeaway is parents need to talk to their children. They have to have more communication and more relationships with their kids and they need to know where their kids, what their kids are doing online. It's a big takeaway.